my first my first sin of the Jewish New Year. So, uh, all right. So, I want to thank everybody. My name is Neil Ash, by the way. I run our adult education committee. I want to thank the people involved in in our committee, especially Steve Denenberg and Joan Charlson, um, who really been instrumental in in getting a lot of our speakers. Um, I also want to mention for Bethel members, our adult education speaker series is taking a break on Halloween so you can pass out candy, Um, but we will be continuing after that um, for the next uh, four Mondays. Uh, I also, we have a number of people from Sanibel Island who usually uh, join our Zoom presentation, so I just want to tell everybody in Sanibel we're thinking of them. Um, they've kind of had a little bit of a rough time down there, as you know. So I just want to let them know we're thinking of them. And I think that's everything I have to say, but I'm not going to introduce the speaker because Ben Ash is going to introduce the speaker. So take it away, Ben. Okay. And oh, by the way, so Pete, if you want to remove your share screen, we'll see about that on the screen here. There it is. All right. Cool. Uh, Hello, assembled members of Mount Lebanon and other people from around the country. Uh, My name is Ben Ash, as my dad just said. Uh, Last year, I was a senior at Mount Lebanon High School, and I am honored to introduce tonight's speaker. Pete DiNardo, I simply knew him as Mr. DiNardo. I don't imagine that is going to change now that I'm in college. Will speak to us about a timely cultural issue pressing our modern society. Book bans and the way we deal productively or otherwise with controversial ideas. Being a college student myself, you might consider me to be in a place where this is a very, very, very topical issue. I have seen it very much and firsthand. Uh, Mr. DiNardo has spoken to Bethel multiple times before concerning political polarization and modern white supremacy. She might consider the speech to be one among many on a state of American democracy. Having had Mr. DiNardo last year as my AP Gov teacher, I can say with certainty that he will challenge you every moment he speaks to question your pre-existing biases and help you grow intellectually, and in my case, personally as well. One of my favorite moments like this of Mr. Donato is when he made one of the most pro-choice people I know pro-life for a day, and vice versa for someone else, because he was so good at challenging us intellectually. Even better, he's willing to indulge the occasionally eccentric idea of the students, which I personally took advantage of quite a bit, as he can say. Uh, I hope you enjoy, and good luck, Mr. Donato. Well, thank you, Ben. That was so kind and beautiful of you. Now I just need to take a minute as I share the screen here and get us ready. Excuse me for a second as I get rid of my one alert there. Good evening. I am excited. Oops. This uh, seems like every time I touch it, it will come back on. Um, I'm excited to be with you tonight. Thank you for attending, either in person or virtually. I also want to thank the four sponsors, Bethel Congregation. It's good to be back with you again. Um, Mount Lebanon Public Library, the Mount Lebanon Historical the Society, the Historical Society of Mount Lebanon, and the Dennis Theater Foundation. Your trust humbles me. And I also need to thank my wife, well, for more than I should really say here. Uh, As uh, Ben hinted at, the subject of this talk, if you've attended any of my other talks, should not surprise you. I tend to enjoy selecting somewhat controversial pieces. The subject has evolved greatly since I first proposed it some eight months ago. I spent the entire time sketching it out. If you doubt that, ask Mike Narragon in the back or my wife about my mornings at the Jersey Shore this summer. But I must say I'm not fully satisfied with um, with what I will present to you tonight, as I feel it probably should have been done over four or five nights. And I may be a bit scattered, having chosen a wide array of aspects. As you can see from this slide, this is my living room as of Saturday. Uh, and it only looks a little bit better than that right now. I'm going to begin with some relatively current events, then I'll shift to a presentation of themes that I argue are central to the array of bans that have happened over time. I'll proceed to the most infamous example, followed by some global cases, 
and the long history. I'll spend a bulk of time on the 20th century in the United States. And then I'll conclude with references to the present, though I really want the Q&A to be about what you understand about the present placed in this historic context. So let's begin with the first of late. Most of you would know this man as Salman Rushdie. On Friday, August 12th, as he prepared to speak at the Chautauqua Institute, he was stabbed roughly 10 times by a 24-year-old. That gentleman was captured and faced charges of second-degree attempted murder. Rushdie is a British uh, Indian writer who is most famous for writing his fourth novel, The Satanic Verses. That novel draws on a lot of his themes, magical realism, and um, it looks at an historic look at the Prophet Muhammad. Satanic verses refers to a set of verses in the Quran about three pagan goddesses. The book itself received wide acclaim. One critic called it the most ambitious novel yet published to deal with the immigrant experience in Britain. But perceived blasphemy in it led to protests and riots. At least a dozen people were killed in Mumbai after police tried to shut down a protest. India then banned the importation of the book into the state. The supreme leader of Iran issued a fatwa calling for the death of Rushdie. One million dollar bounty was put on his head. At that point, already the Tehran underground publisher was dead. Westerners didn't collectively jump to his defense. Former President Jimmy Carter denounced the fatwa, but charged Rushdie with vilifying the Prophet Muhammad and defaming the Quran. The British writer Raoul Dole called Mr. Rushdie a dangerous opportunist. Another British novelist suggested he withdraw the novel, lest it unleash, quote, a unique 20th century holy war. U.S. bookstores had a difficult decision to make about whether to sell it or not, and they usually did in subtle quiet. In 1990, Rushdie issued a somewhat apology. In 1991, a Japanese translator of the book was killed. In 93, a Turkish novelist who published a translated version barely escaped with his life, and a Norwegian publisher was shot multiple times, though he survived. In the late 90s, Iran announced that it no longer defended the fatwa. Rushdie seemed capable then of coming out of hiding and he moved to New York. In 2015, you may recall, the French publisher Charlie Hebdo published satirical cartoons of Muhammad. 12, 12 staff members were murdered by terrorists. Penn, the leading defender of free speech, especially on this current set of book bans, awarded Charlie Hebdo uh, with its highest honor. Rushdie joined prominent journalists speaking about, and this is two years ago, about uh, the intolerant climate. And he argued that the free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. He was not surprised that people spoke out against him with that comment. The idea of that being offended is a valid critique, he said, has gained a lot of traction. He argued that while my novel continues to be published, Certain people, certain groups, certain religions, and so on, have become much more offended and mainstream. To a degree, he said, you could say that many societies have internalized the fatwa and in introduced a form of self-censorship in the way we talk about with each other. The attacker of Rushdie was hailed in Tehran as a hero in its newspapers. We may feel some judgment, but our nation is moving closer to accepting political violence as a legitimate form of dialogue. Current event number two. From the Penn uh, site that I had uh, referred to earlier, its late, latest report, as of last month, two and a half thousand books have been banned across 32 states during the 21-22 school year. There are at least 50 advocacy groups that are bounding, banding together nationally and locally, and some of them have affiliates of more than 300. Across the nation, at least 1,648 different titles have been banned. Of these, 41% address LGBTQ plus uh, topics, and over 40% people of color, or at least a secondary character that was uh, a person of color. The top states you see on our uh, screen here, 
though to be uh, fair, Pennsylvania, most of those titles are the result of one district, Central York. The most commonly banned book currently is Gender Queer, and the second is All Boys Aren't Blue. But the challenge is larger than these bans because there's a silent censorship going on, one that scholars would call a chilling effect. All this despite polls consistently showing that over 70% of Americans oppose remo removing books and over 80% support giving students a more diverse curricular experience. We can look at these and see, it appears that we're in an unprecedented moment. In ways it's unprecedented, but as I like to say in class, it's both exceptional and representative. For those of you who are scholars of antebellum America, you recall that there was a gag rule placed on Congress in the 1830s and 40s. The South had banned abolitionist literature from coming into the South. David Walker had to hide copies of Walker's appeal inside um, uh, dockmen and, and ship workers. The Liberator was banned. Turkey forbids the discussion of the Armenian genocide within the state. I, when I teach about that genocide, I tell students that I have violated two federal laws in Turkey. And in Russia, it is possible that you could be in prison for 15 years if you call what is happening in Ukraine a war. I see the following themes as, as uh, explicit in America perceived or real. We're going to look at obscenity, anti-Christian interpretations, celebration of violence, race and reaction, LGBTQ+, and then this broad question about what we teach our children. More importantly, though, I'd argue in each era or with each theme, the theme is not truly the issue. The issue is a deeper one that deals with control and political power. So if we turn to what is inarguably the most offensive or the most infamous and perhaps best known, the ban and burning of books in Nazi Germany. You have pro propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels addressing the crowd, and he's telling these young students, no to decadence and moral corruption. Their goal was to destroy, quote, un-German written materials. He told them that German, uh, Jewish intellectualism is dead. You have the right to clean up the debris of the past, to destroy the depraved culture of Weimar Republic Germany. Over 30 university towns participated, some went after Marxist, Marxist texts. Some 25,000 un-German books were burned. Helen Keller, Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, Thomas Mann, Ernest Hemingway, John Dos Passos, Jack London, Karl Marx, Upton Sinclair, Emile Zoll, H.G. Wells. In the United States, there were some counter demonstrations. New York, Philly, Chicago, Cleveland, 100,000 marched in New York. I did not find a demonstration in Pittsburgh, but our papers carried coverage of these protests. You can see some here. Walter Lippmann was the most sort of intellectually sharp about it. Newsweek, interestingly, called it the Holocaust of books. Other writers protested in solidarity. Over the next three years, 10% of teachers were removed. Jewish teachers were excised from the K through university system. Any teacher that deemed, was deemed suspect, including 20 past and future Nobel laureates, were removed from teaching. Many professors willingly went along with this. Most scholars believe that they were sort of setting themselves up for those positions that Jewish professors were taken out of. The burnings were accompanied by lootings of apartments, bans on libraries, and works of identified authors. It took Germany quite a long time to place the book burnings in public commemorations. That is not until the 1970s. And if we see here, you can see some further examples of that. And then one of the uh, monuments in a way of memorializing, but within uh, somber ways, uh, what had happened there. And then we go back a century before this to the warning from 1822 of Jewish poet Heinrich Hein, where they burn books, they will in the end burn human beings too. Prior to the Nazis in Jewish tradition, the Talmud, for those who are not Jewish, the Talmud's a massive work. Correct me, Rabbi, if I err here anywhere. Uh, some 1.8 million words in 37 volumes. Just as comparison, the Constitution with its amendments is about 7,000 words. 
a typical novel, 60 to 80,000 words. Its purpose is simply to explain the Torah. It came out of centuries of discussion and uh, after the sacking of uh, Jerusalem, a belief by the Jewish leaders to get their oral tradition down. It was attacked by numerous papal leaders. Uh, Peter the Venerable viewed the Talmud with contempt and ridicule because if Jews had a different interpretation of the Bible, scholars could not prove them wrong. Further Christian abuse happened as Pope after Pope seemed to uh, condemn it. Domin Dominican friar Nicholas Donan condemned it as, as uh, condemned uh, the idea that the Talmud came from God and punished Christians who read it with the threat of death. Another Pope confiscated the Talmud and then um, balderized it, cut out parts that were not considered appropriate in Christianity. From what I read, Talmud scholars say that that still distorts much of the uh, printings of the Talmud to this day. Louis IX dispatched inspectors go throughout uh, Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, they were illiterate, so they couldn't quite read what they were getting, so they just grabbed any book. 25 wagon loads brought in a large pyre in Paris set a fire. Burnings of the Talmud continued through 1319. In 1560, on the right side, Pope Paul VI authorized the Index Librum Prohibitorium. It is a list of forbidden works in Catholicism. Over 500 authors, Protestants, humanists, and the Talmud. It would be recognized until 1966. More recently, maybe you have heard of this book. Uh, let's skip one, I think. I'm going to skip this. This is, I'm sorry, that, that slide got out of, out of order. Um, the book Mouse has been banned recently um, in a handful of school districts. According to one school board member, it shows people hanging. It shows them killing kids. Why does the educational system promote this kind of stuff? It is not wise or healthy. The book itself is a depiction of Holocaust studies. And from the Holocaust Museum, it states, Malice has played a vital role in educating about the Holocaust through sharing detailed and personal experiences of victims and survivors. Teaching about the Holocaust using books like Mouse can inspire students to think critically about the past and their own roles and responsibilities today. And so the death that was being depicted was real in history. It's not purient, it's not um, salacious. It was an effort to get kids in a more simple way to understand this tragedy. Book burnings would continue in the United States even. In the United States even, uh, sorry, I, the click is happening a little bit problematically. We have here Anthony Comstock. And if you can see the screen on um, his, uh, his organization's seal, note the seal, there is a flame there. Uh, he was part of what's known as the Comstock Act, 1873. It would, it would ban obscenity, lewdness, or lasciviousness. According to Comstock, books are feeders for brothels. He condemned Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. He condemned anatomy textbooks for medical students. He condemned especially anything provided women with information about contraception. So the most known victim of him was Margaret Sanger. And as you can see, when he banned because it went through the mail, masses, it says, what every girl should know, nothing by order of the post office department. We know current laws about obscenity today as Comstock laws. In the United States in 1948, uh, we got really nervous about comic books. So we start to burn comic books in Binghamton, to New York. Groups of students can uh, came to burn them. They were creating depravity among American youth. They were, quote, sadistic drivel, poisonous mushroom growth of the last two years. It happened in Canada even, which surprises me, but 8,000 comic, book, comic books were gathered together and burned. Not surprisingly, there was no reduction in juvenile delinquency. The United States' most infamous one was the seduction of the innocent by Frederick Wertheim. This is one in which there was a 
Senate committee that investigated the evil of comic books and fomented by this psychiatrist. Move ahead to 1973, Kurt Vonnegut. Bruce Severly, a 26-year-old teacher in North Dakota, decided he would use the novel as a teaching aid in his classroom. His kids loved it. The head of the school board did not. He had all 32 copies taken and burned in the school's furnace. Kids would not turn their copies in, so he had their locker searched. Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, 2006, burned in Italy. To the right, Harry Potter, my daughter's favorite book. 2001, New Mexico bonfire. They added Ouija boards just to be sure. 2002, Maine, they couldn't burn it because the law banned that, so they just slashed it up. 2003, pastors in Michigan. 2019, Catholic priests in northern Poland. And this uh, minister here, Greg Locke, had a stack of Harry Potter books, Ouija boards, tarot cards, crystals. Um, he added to it the Twilight Sagas, um, arguing these are vampires and demonic influences. He said, we will not tolerate witchcraft and we will not be compromising with devil worshipers. At this fire, counter protesters threw in copies of the Bible, shouting, Hail Satan. <laughs> the Potter series was the most banned book in the world between 1996 and 2000. One parent in South Carolina simply made this statement They're trying to disguise things as fun and easy that are really evil. Another parent, it talks about death and killing, drinking animal blood, and, and, and that's rich, witchcraft, and, and religion doesn't belong in schools. The Focus on the Family uh, co-founder said, uh, it has some positive elements, but they're packaged in the medium witchcraft that is specifically denounced in scripture. Burnings continued in America. When we flip now to Terry Jones, Florida pastor from the Dove World Outreach Church, it has 40 to 50 members. In 2001, after the attacks in, uh, uh, of September 11th, he was angry at the plans to build an Islamic center uh, near Ground Zero. So he was going to burn a bunch of uh, Qurans. Uh, the governor and some religious leaders talked him out of it. Nine years later, 2010, he threatens again, signs Islam is the devil. He called the Quran a dangerous book. 2011, he burned the Quran. And not surprisingly then, Terrorists attacked a UN compound in Afghanistan, killing about a dozen, injuring 90. 2012, another burning. Pakistan issued a, a $2.4 million bounty on his head. In 2013, he was arrested before he attempted to, to burn 2,998 copies of the Quran on the anniversary of 9-11. We keep burning. Annie on, our mind, Annie on my mind. 1982. It's a positive story about two 17-year-old girls having a relationship. The um, uh, ALA counts this as one of the most frequently challenged, challenged books in the mid-90s. Its most infamous case happens in a, in a town that my college uh, roommate was from, Olathe, Kansas. A gay rights Project 21 donated copies to the junior and senior high. Challengers went to court. While it was deba being debated, on the front steps of the school, they burned uh, copies of the book. A district court ordered that the books be returned, and this is all because four students stood up and sued. And the judge had said, they articulated very clearly the intellectual merits of this book. Last year, uh, Mr. Abusmal in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, proposed that books be not only removed from school libraries, but be burned. In April of this year, Tennessee lawmaker Jeff, Jeremy Sexton suggested that we burn inappropriate books. Recently, Hong Kong has had many troubles, but one of them has been a condemnation of certain books. The books that have been condemned and found as guilty are written for four to seven-year-olds. They're picture books. As soon as it comes. It's about sheep primarily, and a pack of wolves. 
there's no doubt that there is implied criticism of the Chinese rule in, in Hong Kong here. But they have banned these books and arrested the um, authors of them. This is interesting because to celebrate the 25th anniversary of, uh, of Hong Kong coming back into the mainland fold, four new high school textbooks have been issued. And each of them rejects the idea that Hong Kong was ever a colony. We go back to the long view, that one slide that I misplaced showed you that the first recording that we have is generally agreed to be about 259 BC, when 460 Confucian scholars were burned, buried alive for the books that they had been using. Plato had argued for the right to uh, uh, dismiss or suspend or ban any such um, negative uh, connotations. It keeps going into the United States. In the 1600s, Thomas Morton's The New English Cana was banned. It was a searing indictment of Puritan culture. Morton was a hedonist who liked to party and he was friends with the natives. So he was not quite your average Puritan. But as I said, my focus will be on the 20th century today. So let's go here to get to the 20th century. I'm not sure how these slides got really sent around a lot, but um, Buzz Lightyear, you may know, was also being, um, uh, oh, I know why I did. I'm sorry, I went, I went ahead. Buzz Lightyear, does anybody know why, how it, how it is in trouble now? Okay. The newest Buzz Lightyear has, uh, he travels instantaneously, but everybody else takes a long time. So he's back quickly, but that it's kind of like 20 years. And his best friend is a woman who he gets back and she's celebrating her 40th anniversary with her wife. So it's, it's a lesbian marriage. There's a brief kiss in the film. You can see it just about to happen. Don't blink, you'll miss it. It was banned in the UAE. Uh, Malaysia um, required Disney to cut certain scenes. Indonesia said that the kiss could violate a law that prohibits, quote, deviant sexual behavior in the movies. Seven Arab states have ordered Netflix to remove it and all gay con content. So we could be angry at them, but then again, this warning was placed outside of a theater in Oklahoma about the film. And then to my sadness, uh, the Arab states I mentioned, and I'm sorry, i would taken that out. So I'm not sure what's happened here. Um, I'm worried that this is not the uh, the right version that I, I pulled up. That's what I'm worried about, but we'll we'll survive with it. Um, the Minion movie, the new one in China, they've re uh, they've they changed the ending into one that matches their socialist core values. They've also in China scrubbed. There is no recognition that Fred, Freddie Mercury was gay in Bohemian Rhapsody. He wasn't, okay? So if we move then to this uh, concept of obscenity here, um, we probably recognize that in Iran, you may know that um, in September, Masma Amini, a 22-year-old Iranian woman, died after being beaten by the country's morality police. Some 50 people have died in conflicts, at least. This is based in a feminist organization that's challenging a lot of places. It's, it's interesting, anchored in um, Ukraine. And they've protested in Saudi, in Iran, in Italy, in Ukraine. Now, we have dress codes, but our depiction of, uh, of uh, obscenity is a bit different here. We are going to look at some items from the American scene here. This film, Purity, in 1916, was uh, banned in Kansas and a number of other cities, Dallas and a few others, because of its use of nudity. Um, although some banned it simply because, quote, her neckline was too low. Um, and others were upset that men's expressions on their faces were too interested in her. <laughs> the New England Watch and Ward Society um, would be where we get the term banned in Boston from. 
they banned authors like William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, Huxley, O'Neill, Sinclair Lewis, Upton Sinclair, Voltaire, Whitman, Wells. And they also challenged an army film that was combating social diseases named Fit to Fight the Subject. The society objected to the film showing a nude woman. The nude woman was the Statue of Venus. Um, again, birth control here, and I'm gonna fly through some of these. All right, the film Ecstasy. This is at age 18, European born Hedy Lamar plays an unhappily married young woman. The film was salacious, became celebrated and notorious for showing Lamar's face in the throes of orgasm, as well as close up and brief nude scenes. Uh, the most famous or infamous one, depending on your, your take, was uh, after she went skinny dipping and she's forced to run naked through the uh, countryside after her horse. Um, it was banned in the US until 1940. Similarly, My Bear Lady was banned in 1963. This is about a uh, woman who meets a, a US Korean war veteran who happens to like hanging out in nudist camps. Um, this particular film was banned in our town in Pittsburgh. Uh, the Pittsburgh police banned it due to its content and uh, the press covered that. I Am Curious, later 60s, was also banned. And um, it is it is a pretty, yeah, it, it's graphic film. But I wonder, today we also have this, Fifty Shades of Grey. And so it's quite a different, both the novel and then the film series. But I wonder, should we? Because in the age of Me Too, does this normalize rape myths, psychological grooming for abuse, sexual violence? So where does the US come to stand on what is obscene? It's this case here to start with. The case is Roth versus the United States. And to be quick about it, it's two cases from New York and California that both deal with gentlemen who were selling something defined as obscene and they sue. The Supreme Court comes to the terms that you can see in the large paragraph over here that says, the item has to be without, uh, utterly without redeeming social importance. And they give this test whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would see this as purient. Just as Brennan said it clearly, sex and obscenity are not synonymous. So let's see if what we see is obscene then. Probably one of the most famous poems of all time. Described by David Gates in 2006 as the poem that changed America, Allen Ginsberg offers us the classic raging screed against conformity and capitalism. Ginsberg grew up in New Jersey, the son of a famous poet and a communist mother. He graduated from Columbia in 1948 after failing out twice. There he met some pretty influential dudes, Jack Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, William Burroughs. After graduating, he went into the corporate world but at night he hung out in Greenwich Village. After being arrested for unlawful conduct, same-sex conduct, he avoided jail by agreeing to enter a psych ward for seven months. In 1954, four years after being released, he moved to San Francisco. It's there that he would meet, I'm sorry, this is, uh... do you mind if I pause for a second? Um, I, I'd like to get the proper, um... I, I think I'm having a, an older um, version of this uh, PowerPoint going on. It's not going to let me open it up. No, did you send it to uh, Neil earlier today? Yeah, no, that's an old. That's the older one. So, um, I'll just I'll just accept it and we'll we'll go from here. All right, so. Um, So this is a, I gotta stop that now. My apologies, folks. This is Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the key, maybe the key figure for the beat movement of the mid 20th century, and certainly um, probably the reason that obscenity laws were challenged. He founded a place called City Lights Bookstore, and uh, a lot of poets would hang out there at Ginsburg. 
one night in October 55, um, Ginsburg is reading a new poem, Hal, at a, uh, a theater down the, down, the, down the street. And Ferlinghetti said, I knew the world had been waiting for this poem. It was in the air wanting to be captured in speech. The repressive, conformist, racist, homophobic world of the 1950s uh, cried out for it. The poem's radically offensive, intentionally offensive. It is meant to, to disturb you. So agents in, in, in um, San Francisco undercover operations to catch suppliers. I think the opening of it is the one that captures me the most here, outside of many F-bombs he drops, but I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving hysterically naked, dragging themselves to the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix. This opening represents a vision of a nightmarish world. He then moves on to indict modernity and the aspects of it that destroy human nature and the soul, conformity, materialism, war, politics. I actually see parallels with it in items that I share in class. From 1922, a flapper's appeal, a young girl who's that wannabe flapper is begging of parents. We've just survived the war and pandemic. We need direction, help us out. I similarly see it as having a parallel with Tom Hayden's The Port Huron Statement. We are a people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. These are people that are looking at the world uncertain about it. Now it's true that these two last ones did not have the profanities that the other two documents do, but they're asking us to have deeper questions. So the collector of customs seized all copies, but Ferlinghetti got a thousand that came in. Um, the collector of customs went to the San Francisco Police Department to declare the book lewd. Trial lasted nearly, nearly a month. The judge was a Sunday school teacher and a moral crusader but he recognized Ginsburg's literary intent and the work's social value. He employs the Roth standard. The answer is that life is not encased in one formula whereby everyone acts the same or confirms to a particular pattern. No two persons think alike. Would there be any freedom of press or speech if one must reduce his vocabulary to vapid, innocuous euphemism? And yet still, the FCC continues to forbid it from being read on radio. 1988, 1994, 2000. So you can buy it, but you just can't hear it on NPR. A few months later, One Inc. One Inc. Oh, it's harassed by the US Postal Service and the FBI. Um, a particular, this is a, a gay publication, a particular story Sappho remembered. It's a story of a young woman re reminiscing about her female college lover as she weighs her life and ultimately renouncing being straight and coming to terms that she is gay. Relatively tame. There's nothing more than a, an overt brief kiss in the story. And the only reference to sex is actually a heterosexual affair that happened. But um, Olson called it lustfully stimulating with filthy words. The first level court called it cheap pornography. This judge said that homosexuality can only be discussed from a scientific, historical, and critical point of view. You cannot discuss it as a lived experience. It would be considered obscene and filthy. The Supreme Court reverse this, and it's the first time that we get the clear publication of gay literature. The Miller test will expand this to be, again, the average person and the work taken as a whole. So we wanna look at things taken as a whole. So would we say these works taken as a whole, the bell jar, Judy Bloom's blubber, or am I blue? Taken as a whole, are good pieces of literature. I mean, there's problems in each. Judy Bloom's Blubber, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's 12-year-old uh, girls that are, um, they're really vicious. One girl wants to be in the in crowd and these girls are mean and they she's chubby, so they call her Blubber. It's argued that it's got vile language, bullying. The word damn is used in it. Um, a teacher is called a word that rhymes with itch and begins with a B. 
It uh, was banned in Maryland, Ohio, Texas, Illinois, Montana, Illinois, Hanover, PA, Ohio. Years later, in 2001, a young reader posted a reply to reviewers. I'm in sixth grade, and guess what? Real life is like this book. Am I Blue was stories about written by young people as same-sex uh, ideas, lived experience. Um, violence, Scarface being the most infamous one there or famous one. We might chuckle at this, right? But I'm confident we wouldn't chuckle at this. I couldn't sit through a clockwork orange. I had to leave. It was to me just so disturbing. But it's graphic depictions of rape and violence. Maybe we should ban that. Pink flamingos. It's an incredibly uh, graphic account that includes animal cruelty and a leading character eating dog feces. I'm not interested in this. Midnight Below was again one linked to Pittsburgh, banned in Pittsburgh. It had its critical reception, right? It was written by folks who were like Night of the Living Dead fans and its critical reception was less than wonderful. It was mediocre and a Pittsburgh Press Review called titled it Horrors, Midnight Isn't Scary. But is this obscene? Brokeback Mountain, 2005. Banned in Middle Eastern countries. Lebanon was the only Arab country to show the film. Uh, the UAE allowed you to rent it in like a blockbuster. Um, Italian owned station banned it, banned in China. And in 2014 was banned in Utah. Beyond obscenity and violence, the early Cold War era issued bans that unearth our themes of anti-Christian ideas and patriotism. So we see here, there's a red under my bed, that theme, right? And we know that the leading group here was the um, uh, Christian anti-communist crusade and their publication, You Can Trust the Communists to Be Communists. So this is where some of you know that Mount Lebanon came, comes into the picture. Um, Mount Lebanon had its own little mini red scare. I'm titling it, there's a red under my bookshelf. Um, in September of 1953, there were charges against our public library of excessively housing liberal and left-wing books. The charges were brought by Miss, uh, Mrs. Claire Mitchell. She wanted to add more books on Americanism. She went through the whole library and cataloged every book. She was upset with a number of the authors. And there were, she was a, uh, had her PhD in, in economics. She cited econo uh, economics books, sociology books, et cetera, all right? There will be a massive meeting that'll occur. Look at this, and it's not showing up on the screen. Walk by the hill. Okay, what's that? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Um, so hundreds come out to the uh, to this gathering here. And in fact, um, in the discussion, right, that she will have, I love these cartoons here. The local papers are, are having fun with Mount Lebanon. And if you can see it up here, um, Americanism Week, the public library with the broom hitting the red book, or a weed in Mount Lebanon um, and uh, criticizing us for that. The official report that's in the archives at the library and the historical society, uh, Ms. Mitchell spoke at the meeting for nine single spaced pages. That's a long set of comments that she had there, right? The library has in its records many letters of support. Uh, I don't know if they didn't keep critical ones, but they've got uh, beautiful letters of people saying, we are supporting you. This is part of the overflow crowd that was there. And then I kind of like this one here, split verdict. And then I'm sorry, this one, the next one. So in the conclusion, it was a commissioner, I believe, that said Mount Lebanon is a superior town that we can get through this. And the letter to the editor here asks whether Mount Lebanon really is that superior. Beyond this well-documented one, Mount Lebanon had a long history though with this. Six years earlier, 1947, our PTA proposed a countywide ban on questionable books. Markham did that. In 1949, Mr. Benjamin Arsham, a Mount Lebanon optometrist, 
was charged with having communist uh, connections and having massive communist meetings at his home. He had served a couple years in, in, in the army. He has a sign placed on his front yard that says, Kami lives here. The following night, a window was broken. His real crime, though, was that he had a dinner party of 15 people, and seven of them were black. And that, and he was a member of civil rights organizations. He would lose his job over this conflict. Uh, he told the police, there, there were kids, you can see their youth, kids that came, they, they greased his doorknobs, put plaster in the locks. Uh, they're making his life miserable. He sent his wife and children to um, Easton and uh, stayed, but lost, lost his job and um, would uh, put his house up for sale and he made it public. He would sell it to someone of any race. Um, we also though have this. Let's see how Thomas was still. 1954, we have this woman coming to speak from Columbia, the Mount Lebanon's Women's Club. They were told that you are uh, uh, having a, a pro-communist speak. She was an Italian who had uh, resisted fascism uh, and um, there is a big hubbub to do there, right? And we find one final local example here. I didn't know this, Mike, I didn't know this. Larry Gara. Larry Gara is an historian that I find uh, I've been greatly influenced by. In the mid 60s, he uh, sort of opened up a new way of approaching things. He looked at the lived experience of black fugitives, those who ran away from slavery. Instead of looking at the white aid person, you know, white savior complex, he's looking at the black person. I didn't realize that he was fired from Grove City. He was fired from Grove City in 1962 for alleged incompetence, but it was because of his political activities. So we also know that there is a, a whole host of uh, films that will be uh, argued for uh, anti-Christian uh, bannings, and this one, in this particular two, uh, anti-Catholic and sacrilegious bannings. These, I think, might be, I don't know, the, the one on the right with um, Richard Bardot, Viva Maria, it definitely is cheeky. It was uh, these two women meet, and they become revolutionaries in the early 20th century, and they're going to take the capital. They're captured by Catholic churchmen who are worried that the disorder of the revolution will stop women from being in their sort of uh, elevated but privileged and separate place here. Um, it definitely pokes fun at the Catholic church, but I'm not sure that it rises to the level of offense that some of the other ones would, like the last temptation of Christ. This is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a deeply meditative, philosophical, and flawed uh, Messiah that's presented. One that's relatable, and one that's as prone to sin as any human being. You go from the novel to Scorsese's film, and you add these temptations that uh, Jesus would face on the way to the cross. This was added to the uh, uh, Index Liberarium Prohibitorum in the Catholic Church. Um, Efforts to ban it happened in Georgia, Louisiana, California, Oklahoma. Blockbuster refused to carry it. Mother Teresa asked Catholics to pray so that our blessed mother, Mary, will see that this film is removed from your land. Oh, I'm sorry, it's sorry on the screen. Uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian. So if you know the story, right? Uh, Brian was born in Bethlehem on the original Christmas day in the stable next door to Jesus, and he spends the rest of his life being mistaken for Jesus. He's not the Messiah. He's just a very naughty boy is maybe the most quoted line. The blasphemous subject had it banned in Norway in the United Kingdom. I thought Sweden was kind of funny. Sweden post, Posters in Sweden proclaimed, it's so funny it was banned in Norway. Several U.S. towns banned it. Strom Thur Thurmond tried to get it banned in, in South Carolina, and um, it's considered uh, 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 blasphemous and sacrilegious. This is Life of Brian, right? Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. So 
if we just, um, I'm just to look at this. These are all for various reasons, bad behavior. So I want to do this to get to my shocking story of bad behavior. The banning of Captain Underpants. <laughs> Underpants was banned for numerous reasons. For offensive language, quote, bad behavior and material related to bodily functions. It presents parents and adults, teachers, as overly hard or incompetent. Well, sometimes we are. The offensive language was cited as things like that old guy, mean old Mr. Krupp, partial nudity, because he just wore underpants. And uh, in one scene, he had to sling off his underwear. You never saw his buttocks and throw it. Violence, misbehavior. There were several school pranks uh, played, right? Um, Pilkey, the author, I thought was great in that he mockingly draws in some of this into later books. Miss Singer Brains, missing her brains, as the librarians of the school who banned the book. And it reminds me of the current debate. Oh, I, I need a new butt. Sorry, I want to go to that. I need the new butt, right? The, the three, three part series. Um, see that I'm clicking it too many times, it's going back and forth everywhere. One more, and hopefully it gets there. All right, I need a new button. So um, in March of this year, an assistant principal in Mississippi had uh, a little crisis. The reader for a Zoom reading of a book couldn't make it. So he decided to step in and read to about 200 kids on Zoom. And he picked one of his favorite books, I Need a New Butt. The, the story is about a kid who discovers that he's got a crack in his butt. And he says, I need a new butt. It's broken. And so he loves the story. He reads it there, right? The school superintendent fired him. And in the term termination letter cited, quote, unnecessary embarrassment, a lack of professional professionalism and impaired judgment. In particular, he was disturbed that the book uses the word fart, which he called inappropriate. These books, as a nice article in the uh, uh, conversation writes about this book here, it's going to come up, The Day My Bum Went Psycho, right? Uh, this is about a global conspiracy to cause a methane eruption. And that could render everyone unconscious while the bums take the place of people's heads. And part of what the author who wrote this is, is said he's a teacher or a former teacher, that he felt that he had to write things humorously to get kids engaged and to read. And one of the heads of the school librarians said, the books often need to be funny. So that's why things like Captain Underpants sell. But I will say this, the author of Captain Underpants, to his credit, apologized for an error just last year. This book, um, the title of it, I don't want to read, but it is like the old Dr. Seuss's that have been uh, put aside. Uh, it uses offensive stereotypes about Asian uh, people, and it was first published in 2010. And to its credit, I hope you, my readers, will forgive me and learn from my mistakes that even unintentional and passive stereotypes and racism is harm harmful to everyone. During the 1960s, we get this couple, the guardians who slumbered. Oh, this is from a Texas, uh, lengthy Texas article, uh, the Gablers. The Gablers started in 1961 to be a small effort to transform high school uh, curriculum and textbooks throughout the country. And in doing this, they will form an organization in 1973. And their goal is to challenge and question every textbook in America, quite frankly. Um, Mel, the, the husband, takes an early retirement, and they spent the rest of their lives working, you know, six hours a day, six days a week, um, investigating. Their subjects will be, they'll go through every word of textbooks, they establish the educational research and, uh, uh, analysts in this little home, and they'd have volunteers come and help out, and they will be targeting, you can see some of their files there, they'll be targeting anything that is possibly uh, objectionable. In their minds, what we are fighting for is mental child abuse. 
They argue that inferior, improper, and blatantly destructive textbooks are responsible for leaving young people unprepared to face the challenge of adulthood. Textbooks have destroyed the pride in America. They've destroyed Judeo-Christian values. They are the responsibility for crime, violence, drugs, pornography, pornography, venereal disease, abortion, homosexuality, broken families. And then one of the pamphlets, and I couldn't get a copy of this in capital letters, until textbooks are changed, capital letters, there is no possibility that crime, violence, VD, and abortion rates will decrease. Textbooks mold nations because they largely determine how a nation votes. I have yet to find that to be true. If you want to find watch a great documentary about this, uh, that's their mission you can read through. Uh, they do believe that they, there should be a, a Christian nation. The Revisionaries, um, it's, it's 2013, looks at this transformation. Part of the Gabler's efforts would then would take deeper root in 1974. I think 1974 we can see as an early version of what's happening today. This is a battle over multiculturalism, the CRT of that era. In this small part of West Virginia, a coalition of middle-class Christians concerned about family values, working-class whites stung by cultural elitism, and avowed racists inflamed by what they thought was political correctness, will come together to challenge the state. There was a recent state mandate that school books should portray the contributions of minorities to American culture. George Orwell, James Baldwin, various uh, people added there. And one woman named Alice Moore, the wife of a fundamentalist pastor, won a seat on the school board and took on this cause. She protested that the books selected were anti-American, advocated relativism, promoted antagonistic behavior, put down Jesus Christ, upheld communism, and would expose white children to black vernacular and teach them to, quote, speak in ghetto dialect. Scholars of this uh, moment believe that the rejection was of racial, cultural, and philosophical diversity. On September 9th, 9,000 students, about 20% of the county's population of students, boycott school. And in the right, you can see, just like in the South in the 50s and early 60s, private classes are held in church basements throughout uh, this area. The one sign you'll see uh, uh, here is textbook uh, undermine our religion uh, as a home. And then if you go here, you can see on the left, even hillbillies have constitutional rights. You kind of get the class divide that's happening here. One minister asked us, pray that God will kill the giants who have mocked and made fun of dumb fundamentalists. The board voted to let parents opt out. Protest expands, there's bomb threats, one town had the superintendent and two board members arrested for contributing to the delinquency of minors. Two police cars that were escorting school buses were fired on. Superintendent was sprayed with mace and received death threats. The board passes a set of resolutions about how we select textbooks in the future modeled on the Gablers. This sparks debates throughout the nation. And it gets us then to a concept that I think is important of the right to know or the right to receive information. In this case, a 17 year old student, Stephen Pico, sued his school district for prohibiting the reading of Kurt Vonnegut. Three cases, three times before the Supreme Court had issued an implied right to receive information. But it's this lawsuit that will give students the right to receive information and ideas, according to the opinion. So the school district has a right to oversee things, but it cannot be one of partisan or political natures there. To see that, you can see some things like this. As they lay dying, pretty classic texts, right? Was considered, looked to be banned, rejected as secular humanism. 
the diary of, uh, of, uh, of Anne Frank was objected to, claiming it was promoting witchcraft, the occult, and Darwinism. I'm gonna skip through some of these because of the time. If we move here, this is David French and um, he has uh, just now started to write a column for the Atlantic called The Third Rail. Um, he spent much of his life, he's a theological quasi-fundamentalist conservative Christian, uh, a, a lawyer. He's won lawsuits against colleges for their speech codes. So that's what he was most known for and as president of a group called FIRE. Um, he now is arguing that conservatives have flipped the tables. Conservatives used to be the ones arguing for free speech. He said, now we are doing the opposite. So he's upset with this. The university speech code that he successfully overturned, the expression of one's belief should be communicated in a manner that does not provoke, harass, intimidate, or harm another. And no person shall participate in acts of intolerance that demonstrate malicious intentions towards others. But this concept of harm to another, you may have heard a lot lately. I don't want my child feeling uncomfortable in school. So this was a liberal approach that he got canceled that is now being used by conservatives. Now it's true. We don't know. We don't, we, we don't want to believe this in the upper left. But at 21... 20, 2021 study of 37,000 college students found that 80% of them censor their viewpoints at least some of the time, 20% do so regularly. 40% of students are uncomfortable discussing their political views with their professors. The liberal cancel culture then, we've been uh, seeing this in Haidt and Lukanov's uh, book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, George Will will always have a great one here. The uh, head of the American Historical Association who writes a screed and then writes this bad apology with it. Um, we have various ways you've heard of cancel culture here. Mr. Potato Head, I don't think it was cancel culture. It was just a change, but you know, we'll go there. Uh, Ilya Shapiro, pretty much of a libertarian, uh, pushed out of uh, uh, Georgetown Law and I don't think I have to say anything, but there are certain people that should be canceled is what I should say, right? Mike Narragon shared with me some thoughts uh, a couple of days ago, um, and we know that the removing of statues has become quite uh, dicey in our nation. That's the Stephen Foster uh, statue, what, eight, nine years ago. This is a Harriet Tubman one that's in, um, I think that's Philadelphia. Mike. We also though know um, Doug Mastriano has a movie that was being to be shown in, there were four different theaters over time. People object to it because they don't like his views and the theaters pulled it. So a, a chilling effect, an informal banning, if not a formal banning, right? We ask the questions, who can speak whose history? So we ask if To Kill a Mockingbird is white savior character. You may not be familiar with this book, but The Confessions of Nat Turner by an incredible Southern novelist, William Styron. Um, it is, it takes some liberal um, uh, a play with the actual evidence we know. Um, 10 writers, and 10 black writers, including uh, uh, James Baldwin, respond angrily. And I think it was Baldwin that said it was just a very bad novel. Um, but two years ago, we had the debate over American Dirt. How many remember that conflict over the, yeah. This is the book that it was questioned whether a woman who is, you know, relatively white can, and she only has like a modest Puerto Rican, I think background can write about the realities of Mexico. There's a book called uh, Nappy Hair, it's for children. And it was written by an old, she's now older, black woman. And uh, it became a big conflict. Um, can't remember the year, 15 years ago or so, uh, because a white woman read it in a primarily black school. And this, the book is a somewhat autobiography of the older woman's life. 
And she had an, I think it was an uncle or a grandfather that kept telling her that this myth of your hair being ugly is not true. You're beautiful. And that's what she wants kids to see. So if you recognize this, this is New Jersey a few years ago when the uh, wrestling official made this kid cut his hair because it was considered too long for the, the headgear. Um, if we go to here, you get the showing of some of the debate over this book and the strong racist underpinnings of the term nappy hair. But the hard part is, is that the woman who wrote the book wrote it as an intentional effort to celebrate the type of hair that isn't Western, if you will, that isn't looking like maybe Beyonce. And the author was prohibited from going into New York City schools and even prohibited from going into Boston schools. We know there's a lot of issues beyond uh, uh, hair uh, dealing with race. Um, Huck Finn, you probably know a lot about that, but the first 80, 90 years, it wasn't objected to on racial grounds. It was objected to because <laughs> trash suitable only for the slums, street vernacular, because Huck not only itched, he scratched. All right. So it's not the idea that there's this racist language that comes in the 70s. Right. James Baldwin, another country. It openly critiques white society. I'm sorry. It, it's about Greenwich Village, Harlem, Africa called Sex Perversion and its Violist. Malcolm X, banned because it openly critiques white society. Well, in 1965, it deserved to be critiqued. We have some more complicated ones there that because of time, I'm gonna uh, skip through. This probably should have been banned. It's the most racist uh, classic film ever been made. Three hours of silent film. That alone is a reason to cancel it. But um, Pittsburgh was, a, 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 the mayor banned it in Pittsburgh, even though the state board of censors approved it. And so we end up seeing that uh, our debates and our, um, our actions are, are uh, going further and further. I'm gonna skip through some of this because I'm seeing the time escape me here. This is, I just wanna show you here. This will get us up to the present that shows you that the primary ones that are being banned today generally more often deal with LGBTQ plus or race issues here. And if you look at, I think I have the top lists here. Yeah, this is last year's top 10 list of the most banned books. You know, we do have uh, a couple that are on there a lot uh, out of uh, uh, The Bluest Eye and then a few by Toni Morrison have been banned quite often. But as Penn writes, book challenges are nothing new. But what's new now is that they argue it's an orchestrated attack on books whose subjects only recently gained a foothold on school library shelves and in classrooms. When you're objecting to the story of Ruby Bridges, the six-year-old who integrated New Orleans schools, when you're objecting to stories of Malala, when you're objecting to stories of Dr. King, it gets very concerning. According to, to, to Penn, 98% of the 1600 book bans took place when administrators acted covertly outside of normal established procedures. Little review, little transparency. But I want to show you that there is some ground for hope. There are people fighting back and there are kids fighting back. And when I look at this, I say, I think we're gonna be all right. So in conclusion, there are 99,000 public K through 12 schools in the country. The numbers in which bans are happening are relatively small. It doesn't mean it's unimportant because it very well can be part of the tip of a deeper iceberg. Are we moving from the red scare to the ed scare? Is this a some claim part of a broader attack on public education? I think it is. Is it akin to past phases on bannings? The one of the 50s to undo the New Deal, to undo the New Deal, the one of the 70s to fight back against the progress that Black, Latino, Asian people had made. 
And there are clearly coordinated efforts happening. In some, I'm not convinced it's a fleeting moment, and I do think it's part of a larger shift. But I do think that there are numerous organizations and people doing the right thing and fighting back. And I'm confident we will continue to fight. I thank you for indulging me, and I'll take any questions. So I'm told we'll just raise a hand or if somebody, let me. I can look, I'll watch chat. Okay. I mean, I'll watch the chat box okay. questions and you can call on people from the score on the floor. Okay. Anyone have a question? Um, we do not have any that I know that are banned. I don't know if we've chosen not to, um, select certain books, right? Because part of it is to changing selection processes, right? So part of where people get in trouble is that there's a process to getting a book off your roll and they violate it. That's what's been, you know, what's been happening a lot. So they, you have to cha change both the way you select it and the way you remove it. And then you can remove things. But a lot of these places have, as I said, do, do it um, covertly. That would be departments choose what books they will have for their students to read and how much input does the elected school board have? And so, in, okay, Pennsylvania is on the Gablers anchored in Texas. Can you repeat the question? For the okay, so to what degree does the faculty and school board have a say in the books that we select and not other? Great, you both are going for my job. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, Unlike California and Texas and Virginia, Texas, where the Gables are, it's a state adoption state. So your textbooks are selected by a state board. That's why that um, the revisionaries focuses is not on the Gables, but on a current fundamentalist board member that's on there that's shaping everything. And publishers go to California and Texas because the largest is. Now, uh, Pennsylvania is the most local control state in the country. We have, first of all, we have 500 districts, which is economically insane, that we don't have large districts, right? So we have a lot of control here. The state establishes standards. We don't, uh, when I was in Massachusetts and teaching in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, my supervisor came from the public system and he left it because every day, that day was proscribed to teach US history, everybody is teaching this on that day. And that's not uncommon pretty tightly in a number of places. So we have uh, faculty members that review textbooks and we select the textbook. It goes up for approval from both. We now have a, like an administrator that supervises us and then the board has to approve. It. So they do approve it. I don't know the extent that they go through every word of it. You know, if, if that's what you're asking, I don't, their, I don't know their process to then prove it. But Dr. Davis, for me, the secondary, uh, uh, the assistant su superintendent for secondary education is the first one that says that, that looks good to me and then it goes from there. But we do most of the deep work to say that's, you know, going through seven or eight books that we might find as a textbook for the US history. Are there any topics that are outright banned for being taught at like Mount Lebanon High School or other neighboring schools? Um, so I I don't know of anything that, I mean, I don't think it'd be smart if anybody decides to teach critical race theory, but it's I, I, no one's ever told me there's anything banned in Mount Lebanon, you know? Um, and we didn't look at the banning of, you know, the teaching of evolution was banned from the 20s through in, in, in by state to 1967 or eight. Uh, but I don't know of anything that's banned. I think that's uh, even in my class for three and a half. I think you've got know, it. pretty much anything we've talked about. So. Any other questions? I got one online. Okay. How are school library books chosen? Uh, in Mount Lebanon? Sure. I honestly don't know because I'm not a school librarian, but um, yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's, so what's happening, what you're noticing is what, what one of the, what I would argue is one of the organized 
efforts that's happening throughout the country is to uh, get onto library boards and change library boards. So that's the public library. So, so uh, the public library. Um, and you can do this and influence it with a small number of people. The second one is school boards. Um, in the period around the January 6th insurrection, I was reading a few articles that the Proud Boys have said, let's look to school boards. And that's not an unprecedented move uh, that you control locally, you build a base from the bottom up, and it's hard to do it. So I think there's a concerted effort to, to seek those positions out, and they will shape the future on, on libraries there. Yes? Do you think there's any value in attempting to flip these tactics used by conservatives back against them? Like, if I say, I want to ban books that are inappropriate, grab your mind pump and your biographies of David Duke, they're going to right. buy or to challenge you know, some books that I'm uncomfortable with the books being taught because it teaches my daughter that she's inherently filthy. Yeah. So there's a gentleman in Florida who does this sort of like as a profession, uh, and he has submitted a request to ban the Bible because there's a lot of like sex and other things in it. So he says, you know, if you have all these rules and you can't do this, you got it. So he's challenging it in that way. I think that's much more about performative, you know, to the point um, of it. It's like the, um, uh, we have a state legislator who two or three years ago proposed that um, all men upon the third child that they father must have a fast afternoon or at the age of four. And it is a tongue-in-cheek tongue uh, proposal, but he's asking the question, why make women be the, the carrier of all the burden of reproductive decisions there? So I don't want to be corrected, but it's a little more fancy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. In a similar vein of public tables, but specifically for schools, how would you be if you had a, a district like, let's say, in the Mount Eagle area or yeah. in the trying areas where there was a, a a non-trivial minority that pushed for a book, let's say about the January 6th insurrections where they, you know, it's called like Patriots Day. Yeah. And they basically said we want that in school. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess it's a two-part question. How would you separate what you decide to have in schools versus like what's available for, you know, 18 year olds yeah. to go to a bookstore to buy whatever they want? Right. So uh, I think the first answer is probably I have to ask about the age we're talking about because I definitely get the idea that certain topics at elementary level, by the time I teach juniors and seniors, they're fairly capable of handling a lot of things. So the way that uh, I've done this in the past when I taught in an AP US history course, there is, uh, you know, there, there's the book of people's history by Howison, good left wing history. Then there's a Patriots history that was written specifically about that. So for the Mexican War, I had a chapter on history history. And how about you know, you can look through that and decide what versions of truth you're going to examine, etc. So if it was something like that, I'd want it to be then as an intentional sort of idea of looking at a couple of views there. So anything that's largely partisan, either way. Uh, we probably want to have a foil up against that, that kids can see at least there's, and I, I don't like the idea that there's only two views, but you got to show at least there's an alternative view to whatever it is, you know. And how would you apply that to like intelligent design? Well, so Pennsylvania is is connected in that. So um, the uh, um, a town five hours away from here that uh, in it, attempted to teach intelligent design as a science. And a federal court said that's just a fact for what they're teaching for Asians. So officially, a science class cannot teach intelligent design. Now, I'm not going to suggest that doesn't happen in physics, but officially that can be taught. Now, we can discuss that in my class, uh, the history class about that thought and those ideas, right? Just like, um, you know, there are certain things that I mean, well, the question would be, right, do, would we rather take the approach of the United States or of Europe on Holocaust denial? 
The United States is much more free to do it. About 10 years ago, the Southern Poverty Law Center identified 10 professors that projected. Europe, you have a much greater chance to be sued for that. Partly, I want to be European because it's so dangerous. But I also understand the concept of free thought, which speaks that we like to have What fraction of your students' reading material is printed rather than online? Aren't books banned closing the barn door after the cows have gone online? <laughs> question. Well, it's great, great, great question. I still, you know, I my students know that that a lot of things are printed out with me, so it is in hard copy. Um, and, and we don't need to go into my reasons that I can demonstrate why that's better. But um, uh, it's, it's interesting because I couldn't, even if I assigned it, it doesn't matter whether it's on the internet, right? So the kids might get it somehow. And we do notice that, right? If one of the slides I had up there was the sales of the banned books, they go up. Like I, I love this one years ago, I used a video where um, this kid, you know, he's, it was a kid in the 50s and they banned Catcher in the Rye. He said, we all just went and got it. As soon as the school banned it, we said we knew it was good and we had to go get it, right? So um, yeah, I think that that's, you're seeing uh, there, the, the graph shows the sales go up for about a year. I don't know if they're going to do it. Yeah. 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 Free speech and starts being, you are factually incorrect. Right. You're not allowed to take a math class saying two plus two is five because it's not. Right. Why are you allowed to imply that the United States didn't do horribly racist things when we did? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think mean, I just would we ban that from being, our culture would not ban that from being published. We would say, I would, I would ban teaching that in, in, a, in a public. High school, right? Um, it was I, on the talk I gave on hate speech. There was a uh, Florida principal who got in on the book because he said you have to teach both sides of the hall. And, and I'm just gonna cover that for a little bit there, right? Um, and but and, and that that's it. To, to argue that right there are there's there's only one side on this one uh you know and these kids know that i told my kids there's a lot we can debate but there's certain things hitler bad the Klan, bad we don't have there's no wiggle room there you know we don't say no relatively bad no bad right then there's a whole there's only like five or six things throughout the year that, that we'll say that about yeah. what do you feel the supreme court is going to end up in this type of uh, book bearing issue, given we have a more conservative. Yeah. Um, well, the it, it, I think we'll, we'll see this test. Okay, we'll see this test that the trend of the court over the last at least decade, if not more, has been to an expansion of free speech, but it simultaneously is rewriting the other part of one of the other parts of the First Amendment freedom of religion. And so in a place that is demanding parental rights, like we, we, we have this odd mix of student rights and parental rights. And in the court decisions, they said that, you know, there's recognition that there's a whole lot of powers here. So if it trends towards religious freedom and parent rights, then parents will have more say to dictate What's happening in the classrooms? I want to say, watch Life of Brian if I did. Yeah. And, uh, I consider it a very funny movie. So I, I'm offended that people want to be in that movie. I, I, I read every Harry Potter, and my daughter's one of them, like 800 things each, and she's dead. But that doesn't make sense. Do you mind if I think one more question? I have one in the back. Yeah. If you wanted to summarize and maybe comment a little bit about the lawsuit against Pat Williams, you know, no. Oh, oh, you just didn't comment. Oh, no, no, no. That, 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 yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't do that. Right. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.